Australia is facing the most challenging and complex set of strategic circumstances we have seen since the Second World War. That's according to the Australian Minister for Defence. In August 2022, the Australian Government launched the Defence Strategic Review, or DSR. The purpose of the review is to prioritise investment in capabilities and the ADF, Australian Defence Forces, structure, posture, location, and preparedness, readiness, to 2033 and beyond. When a country releases a new defence document, most people go straight to the ships, tanks and aircraft that are to equip the force in the future. The DSR might also talk about equally important aspects such as forces being deployed overseas and foreign forces coming into Australia. Salutations. Today's briefing, Australia's Defence Strategic Review, a preview. Submarines, stealth and armour. The Australian government believes the strategic environment has deteriorated. In January this year, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Cavoli, said, Scale, scale, scale. The magnitude of this war is incredible. The Ukrainians have 37 frontline brigades, plus dozens more territorial brigades. The Russians have lost almost 2,000 tanks. If we average out since the beginning of the war, the slow days and fast days, the Russians have expended, on average, well over 20,000 artillery rounds per day. The scale of this war is out of proportion with all our recent thinking, but it is real and we must contend with it. Production capacity remains vital. As a result of this, NATO will significantly enlarge forward-deployed army formations and increase ammunition stocks. Given Australia already considers its strategic environment was deteriorating, and Sakur's comments on the scale of modern conflict. What might the future conflict Australia is planning for? How does it plan to employ the ADF? While Australia is to announce which SSN or SSNs it will procure and how many in the coming days, the Defence Strategic Review should go further in explaining this capability. The program actually dates back to 2016 when it was to acquire conventionally powered submarines. And then 18 months ago, morphed into a nuclear-powered attack submarine program. Regardless of which boat or boats are selected, and see my separate briefing on that link below, the question needs to be asked, why eight or even more, as per the current official statements? For context, the Royal Navy operates seven SSNs and the French Navy six. Only the US, Russia and China would operate more SSNs than Australia plans to. Also, what happens after Australia completes the domestic construction for the Royal Australian Navy? Is Australia going to produce SSNs for export? Land 400 Infantry Fighting Vehicle Program is another that has been around for a long time, with decisions being continually delayed. The original requirement was for 450 infantry fighting vehicles, either the German Lynx KF-41 or the Korean AS-21 Redback. Enough for three mechanised infantry battalions. It's one in each of the Army's three regular combat brigades. 450 was the number required to equally and appropriately equip three battalions. However, this total may be reduced to 300. Given the already significant investment across the other armoured vehicle capabilities, such a reduction would be curious. Without adequately protected armoured infantry, it would be unwise to deploy the other armoured fighting vehicles the ADF has. The Army could deploy some more protected infantry, but would not be able to sustain that effort, something that would not make sense given General Cavoli's recent observations. Another existing project that might be impacted is the Hunter-class frigates, with a total of nine planned to be acquired. But will the RAN, Royal Australian Navy, get all nine of these? Do these frigates, which are actually larger than the Australian Navy's Hobart-class destroyers, meet the ADS requirements in this new future? An existing project that is soon to be completed is the replacement fighter-strike capability being filled by the F-35 strike fighters, with the order of 72 soon to be completed. However, the Royal Australian Air Force wants 100 in total. The DSR will likely cover if additional F-35s are to be acquired or perhaps unmanned combat area vehicles instead. A project that had been around for some time and faced some challenges was the project to acquire 12 to 16 armed, medium altitude, long endurance UAVs in the form of the MQ-9B, which some might know as the Reaper or Predator. 
However, this project was cancelled in 2022. Might it be resurrected? Would an armed medium altitude long endurance UAV that can deliver persistent airborne intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, electronic warfare and precision strike capability for the land and littoral environments be a capability the ADF needs in this new paradigm? Already announced is the HIMARS system, a multiple launch rocket system mounted on a truck, which was an unexpected acquisition. Now, HIMARS is certainly a quality system, but why is Australia getting it and why so few? The DSR might spread more light on this acquisition. See separate briefing on HIMARS for Australia linked below. Something that may not come as a surprise in the DSR is the mention of the B-21. The B-21 radar stealth bomber has been suggested as a possible addition to the ADF. But is this a real possibility for Australia? There is no current program in the ADF requiring this capability. If Australia is serious about considering the B-21, this will likely become clear in the Defence Strategic Review. But what capability will the ADF have to give up in order to pay for the B-21? Would it be wiser to invest in new stealthy long-range standoff weapons for existing platforms? See separate briefing on the B-21 for Australia linked below. But the DSR won't only be about equipment. In terms of force structure, the deployment and basing of forces, we should expect the DSR to talk about further development of northern and offshore facilities and more ADF units stationed in the north of Australia. The document should also cover other critical issues that are perhaps less interesting on the surface, such as interoperability, working with other militaries, and sustainment, it's called logistics. There is highly likely to be an increase in the scale and duration of foreign forces in Australia, mainly concerning US forces, but also significant increases from the UK, primarily the Royal Navy and Royal, Australia, uh, Royal Air Force, and even an increase in Japanese forces training in Australia. Australia's northern bases that are likely to be hosting the majority of these forces will then become high value targets to an adversary. How will Australia defend them? In terms of logistics, uh, let's call it war stocks, and this is not only ammunition, but also other critical supplies. The DSR must cover this critical enabler. Maintaining appropriate levels of war stocks has never been a strong suit for Australia, and the conflict in Europe has only reinforced the importance of this. Australia needs to maintain appropriate stocks domestically, as it may not be able to rely on allies to provide these stocks in time of conflict. Finally, Australia's strategic oil reserve. As a member of the International Energy Agency, the IEA, Australia is required to hold 90 days worth of oil imports as emergency stocks. The latest figures from the IEA put Australia at only 61 days, the only country in the agreement not to satisfy the minimum 90 day holding. Now this level of holding does fluctuate, but Australia is rarely close to achieving the required holdings. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a defence only issue, but this should be highlighted in the DSR. Some people might add that in 2020, Australia reached an agreement to access part of the United States Strategic Petroleum Reserve to bolster domestic fuel security. That supposes the US will be prepared for Australia to access that oil in a time of crisis, and that this oil can be transported to Australia in a timely and safe manner. In summary, the decisions taken as part of the DSR, the Defence Strategic Review, will have implications that will last for decades. Will it lead to an ADF with high-end warfighting capabilities in the Navy and Air Force at the expense of the Army? Long-range standoff strike capabilities are important. So are well-protected troops on the ground. And what level of defence expenditure will be required to pay for the DSR? And is that sustainable? Hopefully the DSR will articulate the ADF's capability, force structure and readiness requirements to the near term and beyond. Thank you for watching. That concludes today's briefing. Happy to take suggestions for future briefings from subscribers. So please subscribe, like, and share. Until next time, Vale de Serre.